Hello, I'm Dr. Asher. I hear you are the new resident starting your emergency medicine rotation. Welcome to chaos. Things are quiet at the moment, but that usually doesn't last long. When the next patient comes in, I'll expect you to assist me in diagnosing and stabilizing the patient. As you know, there's often not a lot of time to stabilize the patient, so I expect you to communicate clearly and be an integral part of the emergency department team. We can't save patients without working well together. I'd like you to meet Dr. Bennett, our ED pharmacist, an important part of our team. Hi there. Welcome aboard. I look forward to working with you. I help out the ED team by recommending and drawing up doses of medication as needed, making sure that prescribed medications are safe for the patient and administer correctly. I usually stand near the crash cart so I can easily access medications, as well as anything needed from the Pixis, the automated dispensing cabinet in the hallway. I also do research on patients who present with overdoses. I'm happy to assist you with the medications you need when a case comes in. We've just received word that two teenage victims from a motor vehicle crash are on their way in. We are expecting a female and male. The female will go into trauma room one and be seen by the other trauma team. We will be taking the male patient in trauma room two. Preliminary reports indicate he's in pretty bad shape. Sounds like a single vehicle crash with prolonged extrication. We don't know much else at this point. Let's get into sterile gowns and get ready. I'll just be outside the room if you need me. If you need to print a medical record, worksheet, please do so now. Or you can choose to use an online version of the medical record. Have the respiratory therapist and x-ray technician been notified? Looks like our patient is on the way. The EMT report indicates that we have a male, 17 years old, that apparently either passed out at the wheel or had some event that caused him to lose control of the car. His breathing is depressed, he has multiple minor bruises and lacerations from impact, and the windshield shattering. EMT also mentioned he was found wearing a soft ankle brace. There was considerable deformity to his ankle, so the soft brace was removed to assess the injury and his ankle was immobilized. Airway is open, breath sounds shallow, good, palpable pulses. We need to determine if intubation is needed. To do that, we assess his neurological condition. To make the assessment, we use the GCS, or Glasgow Coma Scale. It allows for a more quantifiable assessment of mental capacity that can be understood by other medical personnel quickly and easily. The three components that go into the GCS score are assessment of the eye opening, verbal response, and motor abilities. So, I need you to assess this patient and let me know the score. Remember, you add the points for each assessment together to reach the appropriate score. We use the best score the patient gives us. So, if they move one arm all by itself and follow commands, but can't move the other, they get a six for motor response. The patient is moaning with eyes closed, but he opens them to painful stimuli and also moves his extremities to painful stimuli. Looking at the chart on screen or on your worksheet, what score would you give this patient? Click the appropriate answer. Right, I would give this patient an 8, too. This indicates a diminished mental status, which leads to concern that he might not be able to breathe well on his own or protect his airway. Dr. Bennett will need a sedative and a paralytic to prepare for the intubation. Do you think this might have been an overdose? I'll talk to you about that in a minute. I need you to get an IV in his arm and then get an updated blood pressure reading. Let's be quick about the IV so we can get him intubated and stabilized. Click to wrap a tourniquet around the arm above the elbow. Click the alcohol swab to clean the area. Before inserting the IV, find one of the veins on the right forearm and then click the one that looks best for our purposes. Remember, you can't put an IV into an area that is injured. Now click to slide the cannula into the vein. If you have inserted the cannula into the vein, you should see blood in the cannula. Click to remove the tourniquet. 
Finally, tape the tubing down to prevent it from being pulled, which would also pull the cannula and dislodge the IV. Great. Now we need to take the blood pressure. Click to apply the cuff to his left arm. Click to place the stethoscope over the artery. Then click to begin inflating the cuff. Continue to inflate the cuff until you stop hearing the sound of the pulse through the artery. Now, loosen the screw at the bottom of the bulb, and when you hear the sound of the pulse start again, record the reading on the dial. When you can no longer hear the pulse sounds, read the dial. Then record the diastolic blood pressure. Okay, we have a BP of 90 over 50, respiration of 6 breaths per minute, pulse rate of 123 beats per minute, and temperature of 98.6 with skin feeling cool and dry, plus 2. This is a normal, strong pulse. Pulses in carotid, radial, femoral, and the top of the left foot with pulse in right foot irregular. This means that blood flow to this area is compromised, most likely due to the broken bones and damage in that area. Given the diminished mental status and depressed respirations, I will go ahead and intubate the patient. Dr. Bennett, can you go ahead and get the meds? Respiratory therapist, please proceed to bag and pre-oxygenate the patient. We do this so that we have a longer time to look for the vocal cords before the patient's oxygen levels drop. Essentially, we give them a bigger reserve of oxygen. I just heard from Trauma Team 1 that the female patient died. Has anyone seen the hospital chaplain or a social worker? They have to notify the parents. Which is the worst? I really feel sorry for both the trauma team and the parents. I wish more teenagers had the sense to listen to all those lectures on drugs. They're guessing that she died of a combination of prescription drugs and an energy drink. Given her symptoms, they are guessing amphetamines. The EMTs said they found energy drinks and several bottles of pills with the labels torn off. I haven't seen the chaplain or any of the social workers recently. Sorry they lost a patient. That is always very difficult. I feel for the parents. They probably had no clue at all this was coming or that today would be the last day they ever talked to their daughter. Dr. Bennett, what are your thoughts on what's going on here? What do you think is depressing the respiration? Looking at the chart, click the class of drugs you think it most likely our patient took. My guess is amphetamines and oxycodone, but we'll have to wait for the tox screen to come back to confirm. As the EMTs reported, there were prescription bottles with labels removed found in the car. The police are supposed to be bringing them in shortly. When they do, I can identify the medications using a special online program. In the meantime, here are the medications you ask for. Based on his body weight, here is 20 milligrams of Etomidate, a short-acting pain reliever, and 150 milligrams of succinylcholine, a paralytic. Give the atomidate first, then the paralytic. You inject the two drugs into the IV. Why do we need a paralytic for this patient? Since we don't know what drugs he took on his own, or what amounts, I've been very conservative with the amount of sedatives we are giving him. We can always give more later if he appears to be in distress. It's one of the great difficulties treating people that abuse prescription or illegal drugs. 
you never know with absolute certainty at the beginning what is going on and it's always a guessing game. A very difficult, life-threatening guessing game. Now we need another assessment of his mental or neurological condition. So I need you to assess this patient and let me know the score. This shouldn't take long given this patient's condition. Remember, you add the points for each assessment together to reach the appropriate score. Looking at the chart on screen or on your worksheet, what score would you give this patient? Click the appropriate answer. Right. A patient that is sedated like this with no real responses of any kind scores a 3. Now we need to look at the x-rays just taken. Do you see any problems? Click on the areas you think might need medical attention. Okay, now check the x-ray of the pelvis. Click on any areas you think might be a problem. Correct, the pelvic x-ray is normal and shows no injuries or fractures. Now take a look at the x-ray for his ankle. Click the areas you think are broken. Good. You've identified a couple of cracked ribs and a tibia and fibula fracture in his right ankle. Please add that to his medical record, and I'll call orthopedics to come look at his ankle. Next, we'll need a CT scan of his head. As for now, we won't worry too much about the ankle. It's obviously not life-threatening. I've gotten the results of his CT scan back. Take a look and see if you could determine if there is anything wrong. Again, you are correct. We have a small skull fracture with a bit of blood in the brain, but this shouldn't be too much of a problem for our patient. I'm going to perform a physical examination of the patient, so I will palpate the patient's head, chest, abdomen, and extremities, looking for other injuries and deformities. I have to log roll the patient from side to side to accomplish this, so you can't really do much at the moment. Why don't you get set to do the fast scan? FAST stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. It's an ultrasound scan of the heart and major organs to determine if there is any blood in the chest or abdomen requiring emergency surgery. Here is an abnormal FAST scan for the heart. You can see the fluid around the heart where it is not supposed to be. Now check our patient's FAST scan. Click on any areas you think might indicate blood or fluid around the heart. Correct. There is no fluid around our patient's heart. Now let's check the FAST scan results for the upper left quadrant of the abdomen. The first image shows fluid around the spleen. Check our patient scan and click on any areas that you think might be abnormal. Good. Now we need to check the upper right quadrant of the abdomen. The first image shows fluid near the kidneys. The second image is from our patient. Click on any areas that you think might be abnormal. Okay, on to the bladder. The first image here shows fluid outside of the bladder. Obviously not a good thing. The second image is our patient. You know what to do. The FAST scan is negative, indicating no need for emergency surgery. That might be the one bit of luck going this patient's way tonight. Okay, now we need to splint that leg and insert a Foley catheter to collect urine. You take the splint, and I'll insert the catheter. 
Dr. Asher, I've just been notified that the patient's parents have arrived. Is there anything you'd like to have communicated to them? Let them know that he is alive and that I should be out to see them in about 20 to 30 minutes. We need to get a splint on that ankle. I've called orthopedics for a consult and they should be down shortly. Dr. Bennett, we probably need to start some antibiotics for his open fracture. What about cefazolin? Given his age, his tetanus shot should be up to date, but we probably shouldn't assume that. I will get you a tetanus shot and two grams of cefazolin. Since he has an open fracture, he will need an additional antibiotic called tobramycin. Based on his weight, he will need 500 milligrams. Both antibiotics will need to be administered intravenously and started as soon as possible. Thanks, Dr. Bennett. I'll ask the nurse to give him his tetanus shot in the muscle and then start infusing his antibiotics using piggyback bags in the IV line. Okay, get busy with that splint. The first step is to thoroughly clean the area with betadine. Click to pick up the bottle of betadine. Next, flush the area well with normal saline. Make sure you use all that saline. We want this as clean as possible. Infections in bones can be very difficult to treat. We will move the bones into an approximation of where they should be. The orthopedic surgeon will be treating this patient to get everything perfect. We just need to keep the bones from moving around and making things worse. Now, still using care, pull the leg into anatomic alignment. Then, place the plaster splint on the back and sides of the leg. Okay, now click to wrap the leg and splint with an ace wrap. That will hold the ankle until the orthopedic surgeon determines what else should be done. Thanks for doing that. I believe we are close to having this patient stabilized. I've got the Foley catheter in, and I've collected a sample of urine, which will be sent to the lab to test for drugs. We should have the results in 30 to 45 minutes. I've also already sent blood to the lab for analysis. While we are waiting on those results, we're going to have to talk to the patient's parents, a task I never really get used to in situations like this. Hello, I'm Dr. Asher. I understand that it is your son we have in the trauma bay. Could you confirm his physical description and date of birth? Thanks. I always like to confirm I have the right family. Okay, first I have some questions for you, and then I'll answer your questions. Does your son have a history of fainting or losing consciousness? Is your son on any prescription medication? No, not at the moment. He's very healthy. You say, at the moment. Was he on a prescription recently? Well, about six weeks ago, he hurt his right ankle at a football game. The orthopedic doctor gave him some pain medication to help him during recovery. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the drug at the moment, but that was weeks ago, and he finished the prescription, and it wasn't refilled. From what we know, this was a single vehicle accident. This always raises concerns as to the cause of the accident. Your son shows symptoms of a drug overdose, and prescription bottles with the labels removed were found at the scene of the crash by the EMTs. Currently, we are waiting on blood and urine tests to see if he has any substances in him. Unfortunately, we see an awful lot of these patients, and there's not much question in my mind about what we are dealing with here. What? There's no way my son is here because of a drug overdose! You just heard his mother say he doesn't have a prescription, and he's not a druggie. He's a good student! He's captain of the football team, and he's a good kid! Heck, he just won the state football championship tonight! Does that sound like some hopped-up drug addict to you? We've talked to our son about drug abuse often. 
He's, he's, he's always gotten good grades and never acted out. He's only ever missed his curfew once, and that was because of a flat tire. He's told me that he would never abuse illegal drugs. Why? I don't even know how he would get a hold of them or, or how he would pay for them. How could he get them? I've never seen any sign of his using drugs. There weren't any signs. There weren't any drug dealers in our neighborhood. Plus, he, he doesn't hang out with drug addicts. His friends are all good, upstanding kids from families that we know. We know them. It's possible that he could have had a seizure or a cardiac condition, but we've already got the results of the cardiac ultrasound and ECG, and his heart looks healthy. His symptoms and appearance were not completely consistent with the seizure either. We should have more information when his CT scans, blood work, and urine tests come back. Phew, it's always tough delivering that sort of news to family members. But it's especially tough in a situation like this, where there is a probable drug overdose, not of illegal drugs, but of prescription drugs. We see a lot of kids through here with this problem. It's rampant. Unfortunately, the parents are rarely aware of the situation. Parents feel stressed just because their child is in the emergency room. But then to find out he or she might be abusing prescription drugs, well, that's even tougher to take. They blame themselves and feel they have failed their children. And in many cases, that's just not true. Let's take a look at the blood work and urine test and see what we see. For the blood tests, I asked for a basic metabolic panel. The normal readings are shown here. These readings can indicate kidney problems, diabetes, congestive heart failure, or hydration problems. Take a look at our patients' readings and determine if they are in the normal ranges or not. Right, there is nothing here to indicate that this patient has any metabolic problems. I also asked for a prolactin level with the blood tests. This may indicate if our patient had a seizure that might explain why he passed out. Prolactin levels should be elevated if a seizure occurred. Do you think a seizure occurred? Right again. It is highly unlikely that this patient had a seizure. Now let's take a look at his urine test. I think that conclusively proves that he was taking prescription drugs at the time of the car crash. Given what you know about this case, what drug do you think gave the positive reading for amphetamines? Dr. Bennett, I have the results of the urine test and would like to consult with you about them. My suspicions were correct. He was on amphetamines and oxycodone. That explains the difficulty breathing as oxycodone slows respiration. He probably didn't have any idea how dangerous his actions were. Often people are prescribed these drugs for valid reasons and occasionally can become addicted, causing inappropriate use outside of a doctor's care. Our patient may not even have known for sure what the pills were. He also wouldn't have been given the risk factors of driving a car since he didn't get his drugs from a doctor or pharmacist. I'm guessing he took the drugs to get through the football game with the injured ankle. Possibly he's been on pain medication since he first injured the ankle. He obviously was not aware of the consequences of mixing various drugs. In addition to those concerns, I always worry that people taking drugs without a doctor's input could be masking very serious problems. I mean, pain is the body's way of saying that something is wrong. If you were just taking something to deal with the pain instead of treating what is causing the pain, that could result in serious complications down the road. Or people can also misdiagnose the problem, thinking that the pain is something simple, like a sprained ankle, when there is a break or bone cancer or some other serious problem. And like with this patient, I really worry about addiction. Doctors know the odds of addiction increase over time and can usually steer their patients clear of this. I rather doubt most people buying drugs off the street or getting them from friends or family stop to think about that until it is too late. I have no way of knowing if this patient is a one-time abuser or an addict, but I'm guessing if he's been on these drugs since the initial ankle injury, he's now seriously dependent on them. 
I'm going to order an addiction consult for him when he wakes up. Also, the orthopedic surgeon on call has seen our patient and wants to operate on the ankle fracture soon. I dread telling this patient's parents about these results. They're going to be heartbroken, scared, wondering where they went wrong with their son when they probably didn't do anything wrong. And most of all, they will be worried about their son's future. And given what happened, they probably should be. The ortho nurses will be down to get our patient shortly. They will admit him to the surgical intensive care unit because he's still on the ventilator. He'll stay there to await surgery in the morning. Why don't you take a break, and I'll call you if we get another patient in. It's been three days since the patient with amphetamines and oxycodone came in after wrapping his car around a tree. I've got an update about that situation. I've heard from the other ER team that the female that died in the car accident took a considerable amount of Adderall and then consumed an energy drink. The pills they found in the unmarked bottles that were in the car were identified after the fact, and that identification was consistent with what was found in both patients. The female patient was a cheerleader, and after the big game, she wanted to get pumped up so she could really enjoy the after-game party. She ended up paying dearly for that decision. Her death was clearly drug-related and not due to the car crash. Apparently, it was the first time she ever tried something like this, according to the ongoing investigation. Her parents are still in shock and will probably never fully recover. I really feel for them. It would be shocking to get news of this sort. I wish I could stop this epidemic of drug overdose cases. I much prefer the you-really-should-have-known-better cases that have happier endings, like that middle-aged man that super-glued feathers and sequins all over his head to save the cost of a hat for his Halloween costume. Although, I must say, it did look magnificent. There's our patient getting ready to leave. Let's catch up. Hey, how are you doing? You were in pretty bad shape when you came in the other night. We just wanted to see how you were doing and wish you the best. We were the team that treated you when you came in. Uh, well, thanks. I appreciate all the care. I guess I screwed up, huh? But right now, I'm just looking forward to getting home and getting some real food. The stuff here isn't exactly fabulous. Yeah, sometimes the food here can be kind of bland. You take care now and give that ankle time to heal this time around. And please... Please understand that taking prescription drugs without a prescription is a terribly dangerous thing to do. Well, my ankle really hurt, and it didn't seem like that big of a deal at the time, but obviously, I've ruined everything. Most of all, I, I hate that my girlfriend... Excuse me, I'm Officer Jason Elvers. Have you been discharged by the hospital? Uh, yeah, why? You were under arrest for the <gasps> events of four nights ago. I will read you your rights and then take you to the jail's infirmary where you will remain until your arraignment. I'm afraid you're going to like the food there even less than you did here. I wondered if he realized the full significance of his actions. That urine screening we did will stand up in court and probably be all the evidence needed to get a conviction. I wonder where all this is going to end up. More people die of prescription drug abuse now than die in car accidents. The rate of prescription drug overdose deaths is up over 300% from a few years ago. On average, about 100 people die every day in the U.S. from drug overdoses, and prescription medications are connected in some way to the great majority of these deaths. We've got to come up with better solutions for this issue. We are taking steps to prevent people from abusing the system and getting drugs they don't really need, but I think it still comes down to the individual. You have to take responsibility for your own actions, which means not taking anything that is not directly prescribed to you by a doctor, not sharing prescriptions, storing your own medications safely so others can't take them, properly disposing of medications we no longer need, discussing this issue with friends and family members, and if a doctor says, no more pain meds, then stop with the pain meds. There's a reason the prescription was written, and the abuse of prescription drugs is unsafe and potentially life-threatening. Good points. It is a crime to share prescriptions, and those giving prescription medications to others can be convicted, particularly if others are harmed as a result. It's just a shame that such a talented young man with a bright future is now most likely going to have this on his record. 
But it is even more tragic that a young lady lost her life over something like this. I'd really like to see things change on this front sooner rather than later. Thanks for your help with this patient. You did a fine job. I wish the outcome had been better all the way around, though. You know, one of the happy endings I was talking about but maybe you can figure out additional ways to stop this problem, since it's probably going to continue to be an issue throughout your medical career, even long after you finish your residency. Let's get back to the ER for now. If you would like to print this medical record, worksheet, please click here.